Good afternoon, welcome back to Codex. Today we have another talk that was rescheduled from the 2022 JMM special session on recent advances in packing. Our speaker is Shuji Kang, who is a postdoc at the University of Texas Arlington, working with Keaton Ham. Shuji's research interests are in harmonic analysis and dimensionality reduction. Today, she will tell us about the ranks of informationally incomplete POVMs. Take it away, Shuji. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me and thank everyone else for being here. Uh, today, I'm talking about uh, informationally incomplete POVMs and the rank of their grammings. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Seth Goldberger and uh, my PhD advisor, Kasel Kujo. Um, so the plan for today's talk is the following. So first, I'm gonna introduce the subjects of our interest here, which are Williams, of course, and Gabor friends. We're gonna talk about a few of their relations uh, and some of their properties, and which lead to uh, which leads to our next topic, which is about the informationally incomplete POEMs and the subspace that they spend. Right? So after that, we'll look at a few examples to illustrate our uh, series. Um, okay, so let's get started. So uh, since we're talking about POEM, it's actually a subject of interest in quantum physics, but it's also related to a very interesting object that we mathematicians uh, also do a lot of research in. So let's start with, um, so it, it is related to what we call a Fontier. Right. So first, let me introduce what a FONTF is. So a FONTF is a finite union norm type frame, uh, which is a set of vectors, let's say n finite vectors in dimension D of complex spaces, where each of them is of union norm. And for every vector in CD, right, of x can be composed as uh, the sum of uh, the inner product between x and phi k multiplied by phi k, where phi k is a element in our set, right? And all that multiplied by a constant b over n. So we can see that as the uh, uh, decomposition of the operator phi k phi k star, which is the projection onto the space uh, onto the operator generated by phi k phi k star. Right. So in this following uh, in the talk, we'll consider the operator, uh, which we call it pi of k. That's the rank one projection generated by the vectors phi k. Okay. So we call the collection of these vectors p. Right. So uh, this POEMs right that we mentioned earlier. Um, so one type of the POEMs, which we call rank one POEMs, is bound to uh, the type frames. So uh, for the cleanness and for easiness, right, we only consider the union norm type frame. Okay. Um, so why are POEMs so interesting? And what are some type of interesting POEMs that we're going to look at? Um, because there is a fake lecture by Zoner uh, made in his thesis that's, uh, that triggers of a lot of mathematicians. So first, let's, uh, let's look at a few types of POEMs that people are interested in. So the first type is what we call informationally complete. So we say a POEM is informationally complete if the set of the operators, uh, the rank one operators, P, is a spanning set for the D by D matrix space. Right. 
So we have these D square of them, right? They might span the whole space and they may not. Okay. The second type of POMs is uh, symmetric POMs. So we say a POM is symmetric if the angle between any of those two operators right, defined by the, uh, the norm of the inner product between pi k and pi l is constant for an, which is short for the symmetric informationally complete POM is then corresponding to an equiangular type strength with the square vectors in CP. Yeah. Um, so Donner in his thesis, right, conjectured that for any D greater than two, for any dimension that's greater than two, that is, uh, there exists a sig POAMs that are Gabor frames in CD. Um, so this is still an open quest, but an open conjecture. Uh, there are a lot of people working on this conjecture. You can find um, an analytic and numeric results on a lot of uh, on a lot of dimensions. Okay. Um, and right, so one of this uh, this restrictions, which is symmetric is very difficult to satisfy. Okay. Um, so in my talk, right, uh, so our topic today is related to Donald's conjecture, but not exactly the same. Um, so let's look at uh, this one word that appears in this conjecture that we have not talked about yet, which is the so Gabor frame itself is a natural candidate for searching for informationally complete POMs for a uh, for some reason. Right? So let's look at what a finite Gabor frame is. So if we are given a univector G in C D, right? then the collection of all the modulations and translation of this vector G is called a finite Gabor frame uh, in CD. Okay. And right, just for the notation, uh, we say the, uh, the collection of operators generated by, uh, generated by the Gabor frames, which namely are GK multiplied by GKL conjugate called the Gabor POM. Okay. Uh, so one nice thing we notice about Gabor frames, of course, is that it contains exact vectors. Right? Uh, and another thing is that okay, uh, we have this proposition that finite Gabor frames in CD are all font right? So they are actually natural candidates for uh, investigating six okay. right. um, So as we said that uh, some of the conditions are very difficult to satisfy. So uh, in order to further understand this question, we want to uh, lose our restriction a little bit and look at some of its sub questions. Okay. Okay, so we ask ourselves ourself a few questions, right? So what, is, what if we get rid of the symmetric for now and only look at informationally complete, right? So first question we ask ourselves in general is that when is a Gabor POM informationally complete? Right. Um, so we just mentioned that right, Gabor POMs or the Gabor frames, they automatically span the whole space they are in, right? But uh, what happens if we look at the corresponding operators instead? Do they automatically uh, 
span the whole space, which is the BYD metric space that they're in. All right, we'll look at that in our talk. So spoilers, uh, it is not uh, automatically informationally complete. We have some restrictions on those. Right? So um, even that, if we have incomplete POEMs, right, then what is the exact dimension of uh, these subtase that our operators, uh, our operator set P spans, right? And related to that, since if we have uh, lower ranks, right, then we will have a uh, lower number of eigenvalues, right? Which actually related to the number of different angles between vectors. We will see why in a few minutes, okay? So today we're, we are mostly gonna uh, deal with the first two questions. Okay. So let's start with the first one. All right. So when is a Gabor POEM informationally complete? Okay. So uh, in other words, we're asking right, when does the set P span the whole space? So how do we determine whether a uh, set span the whole space? We look at their uh, we look at their grammars. Sorry. So if their gramming is a full rank, right, then it spans the whole space, then it does not. Okay. Uh, so to look at that, right, we first look at the structure of our gramming. So suppose right, we denote G as the gramming of the operators at P right, for all the following slides. Right? Then we can compute our entries. Right, the inner products right, between the pi KL, which is the rank one operator generated by GKL, right, which is G modulated by K and translated by L. So the inner product between two, uh, the two operators are actually the square norm of, um, of the inner product between G and between GKL and G of K prime. Um, so because we also know that modulations and translations are unitary, it's equal to uh, the inner product between G and G of K prime minus K and L prime minus L. So this plays a uh, very important role in our analysis. Right? because this means that, okay, so if we look at the different rows of the Grammys, right, they are actually some sort of reputation of the entries in the first row. So if we order the operators in P in a structured order, right, which we group uh, we group all the operators which the same L together, right? So we start with 0, 0, 0, 1 up to 0, D minus 1. Then we do pi of 1, 0, et cetera. Oh, sorry. We group everything with the same K right? and L is range. All right, so in that case, uh, our gramming G will have a very nice circle-like structure. Which we go look separately. So um, these two expressions right, are okay. So if we divide D G into d square by d square blocks, each of size d by d. Ah, sorry. We divide D into d by d blocks, each of them with size d by d. Okay. So if we look at so this is the L, L primes uh, entry in the block D, D, K, K prime. So let's say uh, K and K prime are both zero, right? So we're looking at this block in the top left corner here, right? and we pick the L, L primes entry in it. It's gonna to equal to, right? We go down and wide by one block. Uh, this block right here. So it's equal to 
the L L prime's entry in this block. Right. But because of this structure, right, we know G is block circulants. And if into us, for example, a one, right? Uh, and for simplicity, I just uh, write down three of them for you to see, right? Uh, so by definition, right, on the diagonal, we have the inner products uh, north square of G, G, one, zero, uh, G, zero, one, G, one, one, G, zero, two, and G, one, two, right? And by this relation at the top of the slide, right? These are all the exact same number. Okay. Uh, so by the actually three by three examples, we see that G is a uh, block circulant matrix with circulant blocks. Right? This can be genera uh, generalized to divide in, uh, to uh, vectors G in CD. Okay. okay, so just a quick example showing uh, what it exactly look like in dimension three. So let's uh, take a simple vector G that is uh, not too trivial. Uh, so that G equals to, uh, this is normalizing uh, constant one over square root two times one, one, zero. Okay. Then uh, two times G, right, just to uh, make things look better. Two times G is this matrix which we can see uh, block circulant, right? The one on the diagonal are the same. And this is what we call A1, A1, and A1, and A2s. And simultaneously, uh, each block inside them is also circulant, okay? So why is this nice? Because uh, we know how to uh, find the spectrum uh, are all the eigenvalues, and we also know how to diagonalize all the matrices. Um, so what about circulant, uh, what about block circulant with circulant blocks? So it works actually a similar way, right? So we will still look at uh, C3 just to, for the easiness to illustrate, right? So we, we look at, um, one matrix we call it H of M is some sort of look like order transform of blocks. Right? So we say H of M is of zero plus A1 times A to the A2 times omega to the 2M. And let's call V and lambda the eigenvalues and eigenvector of this matrix HM. So, how is that related to our question? So, if we look at the product in the Gramming G, which is box circulant, and multiply it by this vector V, uh, omega to the M times V, and omega to the 2M times V. Right, we get right this vector over here, which is exactly lambda times v uh, omega to the m times v, and then omega to the two m times v. Okay, so this shows that right, this shows that this vector, which is actually one column of the Kronecker product between two DFT matrices, right, is a eigenvector of our gramming G, okay? And lambda, which is a eigenvalue of our uh, new matrix H of M is also an eigenvalue of our gramming G. So um, there are D of these HMs, each of them have D eigenvalues, so that take into account all the d square eigenvalues of our gramming G. So the, the spectrum of uh, spectrum of gramming is equal to the right, the collection of all the eigenvalues of our uh, matrices H of M. Okay. And 
the eigenvectors, right, are the uh, the columns of the Kronecker product between the two d by d the FT matrices. Okay. So, of course, right, h of m because each of the blocks are circulant, h of m is circulant, and we know how to diagonalize uh, circulant matrices. Right? So we can compute the eigenvalues, right? We denote lambda m n, which is some sort of uh, ordering that we have, uh, is equal to these expressions. And by some, uh, by some change of variables and uh, some computation, we get this expression on the right-hand side, uh, which you might notice is d times, this is exactly the inner product between G and GMN, right? Uh, so this actually tells us the, uh, the eigenvalues of our Gramian G are equal to D times all the entries in the first row of the Gramian matrix. Okay. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's summarize what we did. Right. Now we're looking at we got more POMs, G of KL in CD, and we look at the uh, corresponding rank one operators, uh, I of KL. Then the gramming, as we said, is a block circular matrix with circular blocks. It can be diagonalized by F uh, tensor F, where F is the DF, D by the DFT matrix, and the eigenvalues are D the square norm of inner product between G and GK. Okay, so we want to look at the rank of Gramian G. Right? Um, it's then equals to the number of non-zero eigenvalues, which is exactly the same with the non-zero entries in uh, the, the set of inner products between G and GK. Okay. So this is a... Uh, a result that we'll, we'll use uh, many times in this talk, right? So this one, right? because we want to in investigate the rank of, uh, of the Gramian for different type of vector G, right? And of course, right, we have a lower bound for our rank of G because uh, we know that uh, the trace of our Gramian is equal to d square, right? And because of this result in, in number one, right? We know that each of the, uh, we know each of the entries is no larger than d. So there can be, uh, there needs to be at least the non-zero eigenvalues, right? So rank of g is greater than or equal. Um, so we have this, uh, this characterization those, uh, on those vectors that generated, uh, that generate the informationally complete uh, POEM. How often can we find such vectors? Right. Um, so actually, uh, generating informationally complete POEMs is actually what we say a uh, generic property. Right? So if we look at any dimension, uh, um, then there's a uh, univector G such that it generates informationally complete POEMs. And also the set of all these type of vectors is open dense in, uh, in the unit sphere. Okay? So if we want to look at why that's true, right, we can look at uh, the set, which we call SKL, which look at just a single eigenvalue. Right? Let's say SKL is the set of G that lambda KL, right, where lambda KL is defined uh, as, as this one, right, where K is not zero, okay? so. The, uh, the complement of this SKL, the set, 
can be seen as uh, the collection of all solutions or all routes for a certain uh, polynomial. Right? So that is a real algebraic variety. So if uh, so that is uh, itself non-empty and open depth, right? But uh, if we want to look at the collection of G, uh, that generate informationally complete POMs, that's just the intersection among chaos of all the class KL, right? um, So that is open as a that is also non empty open dense right, by the uh, property of uh, their SD topologies. Right? And additionally, from that, right, so we know that there are a lot of them. And right, similarly, if we restrict, if we give more restrictions, right, let's say we want K, but we want this treaties with certain support. right? So we choose a, a subset from one to D and we want uh, G to be non-zero uh, only on these entries, right? Then we can find such a G, right? We can find such a G. Uh, so the, the proof of this is similar to the previous one, only that we are adding this restriction where the uh, support of G is equal to the S that we appointed. Right. So uh, since uh, right, we have shown that uh, the informationally complete POMs are actually a uh, generic properties, uh, we want to look at something that's special, which are the informationally incomplete POMs, uh, which are also themselves very interesting, right? Because um, so let me go back a few slides actually to this one right here. All right. So we, uh, in the previous slide, we asked ourselves a question, right? Um, so if, uh, if the Gabor frames itself, uh, they span the whole space that they are in, do their uh, operators also span uh, Span the whole set that uh, that they are actually right, they, which is the the big space, right? Uh, and from this, we can see that the answer is no, right? And then we want how does the uh, the support of our G or the uh, sparsity of G interact with the span of uh, the vector speed? So that's uh, that's next what we're going to look at, and uh, we do that by trying to characterize uh, the incomplete POMs and the ranks of their uh, ranks. So first, let's start with something that looks very right, uh, which is the lower bound. Right? As we said, the rank of Grammy is uh, greater than or equal to. So what does those type of, uh, what does the generators of those type of grammings look like? So we have the following results. So suppose we have kappa is a divided, right? Then the rank of the gramming G is equal to D if and only if right, G is defined by the following. So this actually means, uh, so this notation means the I's uh, entry of G. Right? So this is describing a uh, periodic vector G, right? This uh, non-zero entries at multiples of kappa, which are all the same, which is one over square root of uh, D over kappa and zero everywhere else. Right? Um, so this one tells us that, right? So if we are in a, uh, if, if D is not a prime number, for example, if D is four, 
Right, then we have uh, actually a few choices for those Gs such that the rank of uh, rank of Ramin is equal to, equal to four more. Right, we could have some constants time, let's say one zero one zero. We could have uh, we could have one 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 or uh, this one that we said over here if the uh, L0 norm of G is just one, right? for example, one zero zero zero. But if the dimension is prime, right, we only have this is one is that we have one zero and zero, sorry, we have one once and zero everywhere else, or we have one at every location. So we can prove this result by using actually Holder's inequality. Right? So one side is going to be easy, right? is the uh, only if side. So we only look at the if side. Right? So suppose now we know the rank of G is D. Right? So if that's the case, then uh, E non-zero eigenvalues of G has to be B, right? Uh, with multiplicity B, and everything else is zero, okay? Um, and by our previous uh, result, right, we know each of these eigenvalues are D times uh, the square norm of inner product between G and one of its relations and transformations, right? So let's pick one of them that's not zero, right? So we choose the kappa to be the smallest uh, positive integers such that right, i and K, uh, kappa plus i is in S. This is just to uh, make sure, right? just to make sure that the inner product between those two vectors are not zero, right? So if it's not zero, right, it definitely equal to one, which is the order. That's less than or equal to this two uh, norm-like product by Holder's inequality. And each of this product here is less than or equal to one. So their product is less than or equal to one, okay? So because of one on both sides, we can say that right, each of the inequalities are actually equalities. So the second equality, sorry, the, the first equality only happens when right, one of them is scalar multiples of the other. And the second equality is equality only when, right, if i is in the support, i plus kappa is also in the support, right? which means g is periodic. So getting all those together, uh, we can conclude actually that uh, G of I plus kappa is equal to alpha times G of I right, for some constant. And if we multiply by, uh, by phase, then we get the result, right? Okay, uh, so there's one remark I want to make since we're talking about modifying by phase. Uh, so we are actually doing some transformations uh, that change our vectors. Right. Uh, so there are some transformation that actually preserve the rent. Right. Um, so we will say two uh, two actors are equivalent uh, in this sense if uh, one can be reached from the other uh, by using this trend. Okay. So some uh, some of the intuitive ones are a phase or additive or multiplicative relation, right? Um, but this is not exhaustive. There are some other ones that are also interesting. So we will not uh, spend a lot of time on this, but I'll show you just there are examples that uh, other transformation, uh, transformation exists. Okay. okay. Um, so those are for rank D, right? So what about the other? Um, so we look at the rank of Grammys by um, the way of 
translating these uh, these entries in the grammar G with for a transform of certain letters. Okay. Um, so if we look at if we want to uh, count or count all the non-members in the inner product, right? We can group them into D groups, right? Like we did before. Um, if we keep L as constant and change all the Ds, sorry, change all the Ks, right? then we have uh, this vector on the left. So we, ha we have negative L here just for the easiness of the computation. It actually doesn't matter. We could change it to L and minus L on the other side. Okay. So if we look at this, that is actually the Fourier transform. Of, um, of this vector that we call WL. So WL is actually, we can see term by term uh, product between G and the translated by negative L. Okay. Um, so if we want to count how many non-zero entries are in this, uh, are in actually the for transform L, right? We can do that by using a certain principle on this vector WL. Right? So then, so as certain principles, right, let's recall some of the ones that we will uh, that will help us right here. Uh, that's for abelian groups. Right? The one of them is for uh, any dimension. Right? So it, so first one by Donahoe and Stark, right? suppose we pick any non-zero vectors G, then the L0 norm, right? which is exactly the no number of non-zero entries in G. So the non-zero norm of, uh, of G multiplied by the L0 norm of uh, G hat is greater than or equal to D. Right? So these are the relations between the uh, number of non-zero entries in G and is for our transform, right? And another one that we'll use a lot by Tara Tau is that when, uh, when the dimension is a prime number, right? If that's a prime number, then um, again, we pick non-zero vector G, uh, the inequality L0 norm of G plus L0 norm of G hat is greater than or equal to P plus one. Um, okay, so how we're going to use that? I mean, all right, use the same example as before and do a quick illustration. All right, so if we look at uh, our vector g, uh, which is a uh, constant times one and zero, okay, then we look at uh, different WLs. So basically, how do we count the number of non-zero eigenvalues, right? We look at uh, all the WLs that are non-zero and inside each of them, uh, we look at the number of non-zero entries in, w, uh, in WL hat, right? So when L is equal to one, right, we have uh, WL, this is one zero zero uh, computed right here. Um, so it's, L0 norm is one by the uncertainty principle. We know that the L0 norm is of, uh, should definitely be three, right? Because uh, one plus three is greater than or equal to four, right? And we cannot have more entries in uh, W hat, L hat, right? Um, so similarly for, uh, when, similarly for W2, right? similarly for W2, it's also a vector with only one non-zero entries. Right? Um, and if we look at uh, W0, right, we have actually G times, uh, we have actually right, entry-wise multiplication between G and uh, G conjugate, right? 
And because we know that actually all non-zero entries uh, in W0 is, are all uh, real numbers, are all actually positive real numbers, right? Then the L0 norm of W0 half here is equal to three, okay? So I see that right, the uh, rank of the gramming for the uh, POMs generated by this tree is actually uh, equal to nine, right? Three times three. Um, so actually, right, this is one example. If we pick any uh, vector with two non-zero entries in C3, right, we get a informationally complete POM. All right, generalize that a little bit, so a bit more uh, technical, which I will not get the, uh, uh, which we'll not talk about in details. So uh, when our vector G is very sparse, so let's say it has only two non-zero entries. Uh, it has only two non-zero entries, but because of the uncertainty principle, um, the range of G is that it actually won't be too small, except for uh, when it is equal to B, right? Um, so we uh, reach this conclusion, right? We compute this by uh, using the method that we uh, described earlier, right? So, for we we look at the two different cases is when d is uh, odd number the other one is when d is even okay so when d is odd right let, let's uh, use this as one example when d is odd right then there are exactly three wls that are non zero okay so one of them is w zero uh, the which has uh, l zero norm two and the other two have uh, L0 norm exactly one, right? Um, so we can compute that uh, L0 norm of uh, W0 hat, sorry, WL hat uh, when, the, when the vector itself is non zero are all gonna be D, right? So the rank of G is gonna be 3D. Um, when D is even, right, then we need to look at actually three cases, uh, which can happen exactly the same as in uh, all dimensions, or something like this might happen, right? Uh, so let's say, right, if we have non zero entries, let's say go to four and we have non zero entries at zero and Two, right? Then uh, there's only one WL, which is non zero. Okay. So we can uh, look at each of the cases. And in that case, the rank of G is equal to either D, 2D, or 3D, or 2. Right? So the uh, rank G equal to D right here. Uh, we had our examples before. We could have uh, one, zero, one, zero. Normalize it. Okay. All right. So, uh, as we mentioned, right, because of uh, because of the uncertainty principle, um, even if G is very sparse, uh, we want to look at how how small the rank of G can be. Right? Can it, if uh, if we can see that when D is even, right, we have a lot of uh, variations, but when D is odd, what could happen? Right. So we actually know that, okay, let me actually skip them out because of time constraints. We can actually show that if the dimension D is an odd time, then there, uh, then the rank of the gramming cannot be between D and 2D. Okay. All right. 
Um, so let me also not talk about these groups. Um, so let me show some examples uh, in lower dimension to see uh, what could happen right, when G is sparse and when G is not that sparse. Right? So for example, when G is in C4, right, um, the two line of the results can be, can be concluded from the theorem earlier right, when L0 norm of G is equal to one, is only one possibility, right? Um, when there are two non-zero entries in G, we could have uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five possibilities. And if we have three non-zero entries, right, the rank of the Grammy can range from 11 to 16. Okay. We can see that it also won't get smaller. Uh, so that's when the dimension is even. If the dimension is off, right, we have uh, a smaller number of possibilities. Right? Um, so when there are three number of entries in a vector in C5, right, the rank of the Grammy can be 21, 23, and 25. Right? It also uh, is not actually it also is greater than this 50. Yeah. Uh, and another comment we make is that, right? Uh, so, like in previous example, right? So, in C4, because four have uh, more than one divisors, right? We have one, two, and four. Uh, we have actually uh, three vectors G such that the gramming of the POMs generated have rank D, right? But in, uh, in C5, we only have one and five, so two of them, okay? So it doesn't happen in anywhere else, right? like when L0 norm of G is two, okay? Um, okay, so there were other examples I wanted to Illustrate, but let's uh, let's skip up, skip this because we're we're out of time, right? Yeah. So let me have another couple of minutes, if yeah. Um. All right. So let me just skim through this real. So there are some other very interesting sequences. Uh, we look at the rank of Grammy that they generated. One of them is the out of sequence, right? Which are of uh, L0 norm actually equals D. So when uh, D is a prime number and we define the J entry of, of this vector to be one over root D times omega to the J cube, right? Then uh, we have two different numbers of, uh, of, the, of entries in the grabbing. Right, which is one over D and zero. And the rank of the gramming is D squared minus D plus one. Okay. okay. Uh, we also don't have time for this. So uh, a quick remark, uh, we, a quick remark is that we can see this uh, this vector G as non-trivial uh, is is a group with a non-trivial automorphism group generated by some of the uh, transformations earlier that I mentioned. Uh, okay, so that is also uh, some way to to uh, generate interesting vectors and interesting QEMs. Uh, so let me actually stop here. Let me see this and show some of the references. Okay. Uh, that is all of my talk. Thank you all for listening. And are there any questions?
Thank you so much. Before the questions, let's hit that reaction button. We can say hit because Dustin's not here today. We don't have to smash the button. Um, thanks so much for the talk. If you have a question, please feel free to chime in. Um, yeah, I actually have one. Um, so, um, informationally non-complete uh, orbits, 